Hello, friends of the Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum. I'd like to wish you a very warm welcome to this session of the GMF 2020. My name is Sarah Kelly. I host the main international news program and the political talk show Conflict Zone at DW, and I'm really thrilled to be your moderator. Today, we're taking a look at the internet in autocratic states, where governments have been known to restrict access to websites and social media platforms to limit the amount of free information. In fact, we're using the internet and social media to make this digital conversation happen, but in many parts of the world, people may not be able to see events like this because access online is severely limited. Before we begin our discussion, let's take a closer look. The internet, window to the world. Information freely available for all. Is it a utopia or are we heading towards dystopia? Welcome to the second online session of the Global Media Forum. More than three billion people live in countries ruled by autocrats. What they're allowed to see is strictly controlled and restricted. Consider China. When the People's Republic celebrates its anniversary, sensor bots go into overdrive. Nobody in China should see what happened on Tiananmen Square in Beijing 31 years ago. Autocrats have learned that censoring the internet is an effective political instrument. But rights activists also network via online platforms. They're an important tool for whistleblowers, dissidents, and journalists. I'm ready. Is the diversity of opinion on the internet safe? Or is a clampdown imminent? Between utopia and dystopia, the internet in autocratic states. If you're just joining us, this is the Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum 2020. I'm Sarah Kelly. We're discussing how the digital revolution can ultimately succeed in boosting and sustaining diversity of opinion in autocratic countries. If you're watching via Facebook Live, please do feel free to get involved in the conversation. You can leave your questions in the comments section. I will be sure to ask as many of them as possible. You can also take our poll. We would like to know how much you depend on the internet for access to free information. So let's get started. We have the great honor and the great pleasure of discussing this important topic with champions of human rights and journalists who are on the front lines risking arrest and prosecution for doing their jobs. Maria Reza is the co-founder and CEO of Rappler.com, an online news organization based in the Philippines. Lina Italia is the co-founder and editor-in-chief of Maramas, one of the last remaining independent media outlets in Egypt. And Marcus Biko is the Secretary General of Amnesty International in Germany. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us for this Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum. And Maria, I'd like to begin with you because your news organization, Rappler, you've published explosive accounts of rights abuses in the Philippines, including the criminal manner in which the police are conducting the drug war. As a result, you've come under fire from the authorities. You were recently convicted of cyber libel. Also within the past 24 hours, the president, Rodrigo Duterte, called you a fraud. Set the stage for us. How is the government in the Philippines using the internet to control the narrative and to try and silence independent journalists like yourself? Uh, my quick answer to the question the show is trying to answer is dystopia. And, you know, uh, I'll take you through the four years where essentially the internet and social media in particular has helped uh, a process that I've been calling the death by a thousand cuts of our democracy, you know, gradually uh, slicing it, bleeding out until you're so weak that democracy dies. In our case, it started four years ago with the weaponization of social media, flooding with so much information, so much hate, uh, pounding fracture lines of society, and then making you doubt exactly what the facts are. Because in the age of social media, when social media has become a behavioral modification system, when you say a lie a million times, you can actually turn it into a fact. 
we can have infinite realities and and that makes us all doubt exactly what the facts are without facts you can't have truth without truth you can't have trust without trust you don't have democracy i mean that's the first 2016 was the weaponization of social media for us 2017 was when the attacks bottom up were joined by the government top down our president Duterte, in his State of the Nation address, uh, mimicked the same attacks, and um, uh, that was followed a week later with the first subpoena. 2018 was the year when I had 11 cases and investigations filed against Rappler by the government, and uh, 2019 was when eight arrest warrants were issued against me and against uh, colleagues in Rappler, I was arrested twice in a five-week period and detained once. 2020, uh, 2020 was the conviction that I had just June 15th, right? So I'll give you an example. The narrative seeded in 2016 is Maria Ress is not a journalist. She's a criminal. Fast yeah. forward four years later, you actually can say that even though we are, of course, challenging it and the legal acrobatics to bring us to this place shows you exactly how weak our democracy has so become. There has been that slow and gradual normalization of that narrative to the point where it's now in the courts for you, Maria. Um, if it is death by a thousand cuts, as you have highlighted, Lena, the cuts are really deep where you are operating in Egypt, which happens to be the third largest jailer of journalists, according to the Committee to Protect Journalists. Um, you're running one of the last remaining independent media outlets in Egypt. You have also been arrested. Uh, your offices have been raided. Your site has been blocked without any explanation, uh, Lena. When people want to get reliable and independent fact-based information online right now in Egypt, just, just walk us through the situation um, in your country before we talk about your personal experience. What do they find right now in Egypt? I mean, it's, it's hard to get um, independent, um, authoritative information about what's going on in the country, mostly because um, all the media operating are either directly run by the state or have pledged allegiance to the state in a way or another. And, you know, the, those of us who are still in this realm of independence are uh, barely being able to do their jobs with constant forms of harassment. And I'm not just talking about... Uh, institutions, the few institutions left that are still trying to um, to engage in professional uh, and independent journalism, but I'm also talking about the individual uh, writers, bloggers, um, social media influencers who, you know, um, can report on things in their capacity as witnesses and who most of the time uh, end up uh, lending, um, lending into uh, cases and prosecution processes where uh, they are prosecuted for uh, for diffusing false news. Um, so it's been really, really hard uh, for people to to access um, quality information about what's going on. And it's been the issue has been exacerbated by the fact that um, we've been going through this pandemic, where you know there is a real fast for information, first-hand information, because people's lives are on the front lines here and. Um, and still, um, there is there is this constant shortage. So, with such challenges like that, how how have you been able to break through? Um, it's been quite difficult because uh, up until last year, we thought that uh, we are very marginal and we are left alone just because we are very marginal. But at the same time, uh, even within our marginality, as you mentioned, our website has been blocked since two thousand and seventeen, and we've been having to resort. To alternative uh, publishing methods, which um, are not very straightforward, it's not a very seamless way for for people to access uh, to access our content. However, we still manage to um, give alternative uh, websites and links for people to access uh, the website. And by the way, our website is not the only one blocked by far. We're over 500 websites that have been blocked in the country since 2017. And this renewed policy of, um, of, of, of controlling the online spaces by directly blocking websites, which has never been uh, a policy that Egypt has adopted in the last years. But also what happened last year was the raiding of our offices and the arrest of our colleagues and myself included. It has felt that there is a whole new line of, uh, of possibility of oppression when it comes to us. But I guess um, our our strategy has been so long as we are free, free in the sense that we are not in jail, we'll continue publishing. Uh, but uh, the toll in terms of fear, in terms of not 
not knowing what will happen um, has been higher uh, recently. So it's something that we need to navigate. It's more of a psychological thing that we need to navigate all the time. But so long as we're here, right. um, and and I and I guess the two things that that support our work are the fact that we are a collective. We're a group of journalists working together. So so there is this empowerment by the collective, and the fact that our newspaper has garnered uh, a wider audience in the last years and obviously as you know whenever there is a major act of censorship there is far more attention so we gained actually a lot more attention after what happened last year um, so that's okay. also sort of encouraging the fact that people want um, this this our media to continue basically so so you're important um, you're you're essential um, to 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 information in your country right now um, and you can certainly see that um, Marcus I'd like to ask you because um, in addition to being the Secretary General of Amnesty International in Germany as we mentioned you're also the chair of Amnesty's um, steering group on human rights in the digital age. I'd like to get the big picture from you now um, when we look at the internet in autocratic states what are you observing around the world as amnesty? I mean, what we see looking at the state of freedom on the internet and the use of the internet and the threats and challenges and opportunities, it reflects very much what's happening on an overall level when we look at the world. Rep repression is growing. We see that human rights are being attacked, that freedom of press is being attacked, free media is being attacked, trade union activists and lawyers are being attacked. And anybody who tries to defend human rights and their rights is being attacked and the space for civil society is shrinking. So this is the overall context in which we are now looking at what's happening on the internet. And I think the good news is that, and we've heard from Maria and from Lena, that the internet still, the internet and digital communication channels still provide um, on a daily basis a powerful infrastructure and they provide a space for, for billions of people to have access to information, to exchange ideas and thoughts, to connect, to participate in a public but also partly private space where, as other spaces have already been closed. But then, on the other hand, the downside is, and we've also heard about that, this public and private space is under attack uh, by authoritarian states, by corporate and economic actors, and also business dynamics, and also special interest groups. And so this is the one side of it, is looking at freedom of the internet mm. and the positive use of the internet. Um, which, of course, if we look at it, it needs a much more differentiated look. I mean, the, the headline here was the Internet in authoritarian states. But I think if we look across the globe, the picture is dark not only in those states. It starts with access. Right. Um, if, you look at the, if you look at the numbers at the end of last year, IHTU estimates that 53 percent of the global population are using the Internet, which reminds us that there's still a huge number of people who don't even have access, um, okay. regardless of, of what. And then the level of, of freedom of expression and the access of information depends with not only the country you live in, but your economic status, whether you belong to a group which is at the risk of being marginalized or threatened. So that's the one side. And then the other side is what Maria uh, referred to. The internet as a tool in the hands of the enemies of democracy, of transparency, of freedom of speech, of truth and facts. And that's the other side where we are seeing systematic attacks, um, which, which, which Lena and Maria have partly referred to, and which we as an organization working with partners uh, across the globe see. Well, be, be it internet shutdowns, which mm -hmm. have increased largely. Uh, be it targeted surveillance, mass surveillance, pro profiling, smear campaigns. We, we've heard of some of those from Maria and Lena. Thank you so much, Marcus. And, and just to also underscore what you're saying, I'd like to bring in the results from, from, from our poll, in fact, because they do underscore um, some of the points that you were making. We asked in the beginning of our session how much you depend on the Internet for access to free information. Well, 41 percent of you said that it was essential. 29 percent said not very much. 
and only 29% said not very much. So again, it just underscores um, the importance of, of what all of you are doing, um, providing reliable information um, on the internet. And to Maria, I'd like to turn to you with that and ask you about the challenges that you're facing in doing your work and, and to what extent you feel that weight on your shoulders of being one of the few sources still providing independent journalism, investigative journalism that really, you know, sort of goes beyond. So I think what you need to, the way I look at this, and, uh, and disease is a perfect example in the age of COVID, right? Uh, it, it's almost like um, press freedom in the Philippines. The Philippines has a, a constitution very similar to the United States. We have a Bill of Rights. Press freedom is enshrined in our constitution. But over the last uh, few years, we have seen these ad hoc attacks, journalists jailed, jur journalists killed. Uh, just a month ago, the largest broadcaster, ABS-CBN, was actually shut down. Uh, very similar to Rappler, a small regulatory agency gave them a cease and desist order in January 2018. A small regulatory agency tried to, t to take away our license. We've been fighting it. On May 5th this year, ABS-CBN was given a cease and desist. Within a few hours, they went dark. And, you know, the last time this happened was in 1972 when Ferdinand Marcos declared martial law and ABS-CBN was shut down for 14 years. Uh, it is now on a lifeline. It is. It has been going through these grueling uh, hearings in Congress. Uh, the vote is expected any day now. Imagine shutting down the largest broadcaster in your nation. So I think the 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 metaphor I use is it's a disease. If you're a journalist or the entire body of journal of of journalists in the Philippines, press freedom. Some days we wake up, and you you feel perfectly fine. Other days you wake up and you've got a really bad fever and you can barely get out of bed. But despite all of that, you do the best that you can mm. with what you have because you know that this time matters. You know, the, our way to fight back is more journalism, uh, demanding accountability, pointing out that the impunity in the drug war shouldn't happen, that the numbers of our COVID shouldn't be shifting, that the impunity of the propaganda war on social media should not be manipulating Filipinos. So, we continue to do this every day. So then what's your practical advice then, Maria, to, you know, potential budding journalists, to, to activists in the field who, who might also want to start operating in challenging environments such as the one that you're operating in? Uh, I, and I'll, I'll speak just about the Philippines, because I think they're they're slightly different, although what social media has done, Facebook in particular, the world's largest distributor of news, right, is it has created one playing field where a lie in one country slips to another. Uh, but I think right now, look at it as an opportunity, right? Because we're, you're standing on the rubble of what used to be. Press freedom the way we knew it is gone. And you can actually define what the world is going to become. That's incredibly empowering. And uh, we need new, fresh energy. We need to be able to operate as if the intimidation doesn't exist. Lena, would you like to weigh in here? I mean, how, how did you manage to cut through the narrative in Egypt? Because you had actually so many technical barriers um, in terms of operating. Do you perhaps have, have any tips um, for people who have had their website shut down? Uh, I feel I feel it's it's really a dynamic question here in the sense that um, we in the context of Egypt, uh, people had a taste of what it looks like to have a diversity of narratives. Um, shortly before the revolutions took place in 2011, but also shortly after when there was this temporary opening in the media space, in the media landscape, and in media in its broader sense, in the sense of um, people also publishing independently and individually on their pages and becoming influencers and so on. And this is a point at which people realize that there is a possibility to hear different narratives than those engineered by the state. And then all of a sudden, there was this major shutdown on this, on this openness um, and this is, uh, and this is, uh, and this is also, this is something that exposed people to, 
to a, a sort of disorientation. How is it possible not to have not to have um, you know not to have independent voices, not to have uh, alternative uh, you know narratives to that of the state? And I feel like we hinge on this reality. We hinge on this desire for people to know. So if if you're asking for tips or advice. My tip, my 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 biggest lesson um, to our work in Meta is that so long as you provide professionally produced um, non-ideological media uh, that is empirically powered, that is fact powered, that is well told and well produced, um, people will come to you no matter what, right? So, uh, so at the end of the day, the internet, uh, even though it became uh, which is a subject matter of this panel, a space that is highly controlled by the authorities. It is also um, a space that cannot be 100% controlled. It's a space that is full of cracks. And as dissident media uh, in working under different authoritarian regimes, if we learned how to do one thing is basically how to work through the cracks, basically, including those, those of the highly controlled online space. So, so if you're asking about a tip, my tip would be to serve um, the information that you're producing to, to, to basically um, uh, uh, respond to people's desire for independently well-produced mm. uh, um, information, basically, and narratives uh, oh. by consequence. Okay, so, so to respond to, to the demand in the best way that you possibly can. Um, Marcus, would you like to weigh in here, perhaps? Because, I mean, Amnesty um, employees are also operating, of course, under challenging environments. And I'd like to ask you um, how that changes the way that you're doing your work. Because, I mean, we've, we've seen recent rulings, for example, in Turkey against Amnesty employees. Of course, now, you know, we have the, the very quickly moving situation in Hong Kong, for example. I mean, how does that change... Uh, the way that Amnesty works around the world. Yeah, it, it was already a challenge before the corona uh, pandemic. Um, given that we all use data, we have to secure integrity and, uh, and, and also really protect uh, staff and especially the people we talk to, the contacts and, the, and, and, and data. And of course, with the coronavirus and many other things going digital, it's another challenge. But, I mean, that's the reason why we're in touch with other organizations like Tactical Tech, like Access Now, like Citizen Lab. We have built up a team which not only supports amnesty people, but also supports human rights defenders and journalists across the globe, along with other organizations, to help them protect their digital devices, uh, to give advice, because what we also see is not only targeted surveillance and attacks, but it's also... Uh, as Lena pointed out, it's so important that you can maintain your, your, your media professional integrity. And part of the attacks are, are trying um, to, for instance, change and manipulate information, uh, giving the feeling that you have published it, but it's actually false information which is being put out in your name um, and using uh, different techniques. And so, so that's, that's an area where one thing what we need is we need to build on the creativity of many who are out there and have, mm -hmm. who have been supportive to keep, to keep the media out, outlets going and to protect the individuals and the media institutions. Then on the other hand, we need expert control. For instance, the EU um, is still, we're still waiting for a much more precise and restrictive dual-use export regulation, because currently technology from Europe is still being exported in many con countries, and they're being used against journalists and activists. We are currently... Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a company, NSO Group, from Israel, who is supplying uh, to many state security services software. We've just... Uh, we just published a report uh, on Morocco uh, on a journalist um, who, who, who was uh, called Omaradi, who was surveilled and targeted. And actually, the response of the government is that they now want amnesty to move out of the country because we have made this public. So it, wow. also, has a, it also has a responsibility of the international community on technology export regulation and also to establish that we have a governed public space with good governance on an international level, be it um, the strengthening of, of privacy, as we've seen it in the UN, and, and really making sure that, that 
that the internet is on, not only a space for for free media, but it's also a safe, a safer. I mean, we are mm -hmm. far away from safe space, but a safer space for people who, who want to who want to access that, that information. And that is certainly a call to action, if I ever heard one. Um, I'd also like to ask uh, you, Maria and Lena, as well, what you would like to see from the international community. But before we do that, I'd like to start to bring in some of the questions that we're getting from our viewers, who, by the way, are from um, already, we know, the following countries. We have individuals from Puerto Rico, Uganda, Philippines, Brazil, Ghana, Australia, Pakistan, um, Senegal, just, just to name a few of, of where our viewers are coming from. And they have a question for you, Lena, about how you're operating in Egypt. Um, this is coming from Agnes Tomasi. She wants to know, were the websites in Egypt blocked after legal action by the government or just arbitrarily? And how are you as media workers fighting these autocratic decisions? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, thank you, Agnes, for the question as well. Um, basically, uh, in 2017, when uh, uh, the government campaign to block websites uh, started taking place, it was uh, done completely outside the framework of any law. Uh, and it preceded actually the passing of a draft law later on, uh, which is basically the Cyber Crime Act, which basically legalized blocking. Um, so it preceded all of these acts. And uh, actually, uh, when the blocking of our website happened, we took uh, a decision to do uh, three things, basically, um, to continue publishing and to find alternative ways to disseminate our content, so to not let the blocking an excuse or a reason to stop working uh, or to stop the work we have started some seven years ago. It was our birthday, by the way, last week. So that's one thing. Another course of action is uh, to basically contest the blocking of our website in the court. So we raised the case against the authorities, against the government in court, um, which uh, took us nowhere, but we took it um, as a position to basically uh, go to the House of Justice and um, to contest the, the what we consider an unlawful uh, blocking of our website. Uh, but the case was withheld and there was no verdict on it in the end. And the third course of action was to basically raise awareness about these increasing um, um, these increasing control and, and restrictions on online spaces as manifested in the blocking of the websites uh, compared to uh, in, in parallel to other measures as well. So these are the three things um, we have been doing since the since the blocking uh, since the blocking happened. And like I said before, because the internet is a space full of cracks, uh, the blocking hasn't really stopped us. Um, from publishing. It is detrimental in the sense of it's harder to do business, it's hard to generate revenue, it's hard to, um, to point to our archive in an integral way, but we continue to publish um, as if there's no block, basically. People have forgotten even that there has been a block on our website because of the, because of the fact that we have continued publishing. So like I said, so long as um, we are not um, physically taken, uh, we, we, we feel it's always possible to just continue working somehow. I, I find it incredible how you say that. So long as we're not physically taken, you, you say it so nonchalantly, actually, Lena, but you know that, that there's, there's so much gravity, actually, to your personal safety. Uh, do you think about that? I mean, like, do you wake up in the morning and, and, and think, I might be taken today? Oh yes, all the time. <laughs> I mean, how do you how do you Sometimes how do you continue to function in all seriousness? How do you continue to function mentally under those conditions? Like I said, I feel like it's it's we bounce. I always like to say it's not uh, we're not out there um, brave and fearless and courageous as people like to describe us because a lot of the times we're very fearful and not just me, everyone on my team. And sometimes we have question marks about how far we can go in this. And you know, is there a point where we need to announce uh, the 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 end of everything we have started because you know our mantra has been. We're not the ones who are going to stop. Um, we're not the ones. We, we we like to believe that we're not the ones who are going to shut down our operations by our by our own hands. Um, so so we have we have serious moments of reckonings and questioning, especially after what happened in November. But at the same time, when we look at what we created and when we look um, at the need for it, it gives us a sense of purpose. We're also scared that if we decide one day to close this website, that we will lose our sense of purpose. Many of us are still operating and being able to exist in Egypt because of this very um, organization that um, 
has evolved much more than being a space of practice. It's a, it's a, a job. It's a, it's a way of living, and it's a way of of also bringing together community at a time when uh, we feel so ruptured and scattered and unable to be together because of the death of politics in this country. So, so all of these things give us a sense of purpose that we always navigate next to our constant fear and our constant question marks mm. about how far we can go. So. Yeah. Okay. So, so operating under constant fear, uh, Maria, you've already been sentenced. We know. Um, so, I mean, the the, the jail time is already, um, you know, out there. Um, tell tell us how it is for you uh, operating under those conditions. And I'd just like to ask you because, you know, when you look at the Philippines specifically, the president Rodrigo Duterte and his administration, they they they're they're polling relatively highly in the polls. I mean, the, the public appro approval ratings are in his favor. Despite all of this independent reporting that, that you're putting out there um, with regard to extrajudicial killings, you know, violations of, of rule of law in the country, how do you mentally reconcile that as a journalist, knowing um, that the public is apparently favoring what he's doing despite, you know, evidence that it is not necessarily the correct approach? So, number one, we really don't know right now because this is our, I'm going to say, our 16th week of lockdown. Uh, it's a very military, militaristic, very security-driven lockdown. Uh, and uh, the unhappiness of the way this has gone on, you know, for the first time, President Duterte actually has to perform and he can't demonize a virus, even though I think that he tried. He said he would swat it away early on before declaring the lockdown. So that, that's the first. Uh, so we don't really know. But having said that, uh, it has been four years of living in an environment where violence and fear is part of the oxygen you breathe. When I interviewed President Duterte in December of 2016, so he was a few months into his his presidency, he actually, I asked him that. I said, do you still feel it's necessary? You know, why violence? Violence in language, violence in deed. This is a, a president who admitted to me in an interview he killed three people, right? This was before he ran for president. Uh, and, uh, and he said, absolutely, that's what Filipinos need. That's the way my president thinks. So having said that, uh, violence and fear has an impact on statistical services. I think this is something we've seen globally. How do you account for fear when the survey needs to be done in the person's home mm -hmm. when their name is on a list, right? And names on lists are very dangerous in the Philippines. Uh, President Duterte gave me a list like this uh, in our last interview, and uh, you know many of those people died. That, that was a drug war list. So I think that's the second. And then I think the third one is that we are coming to an end where these kinds of ad hoc attacks on our constitution, the kinds of violations of our rights. The reason I speak now is because my rights have been violated as a Filipino citizen uh, and, and my rights as a journalist, right, uh, have also been violated. So uh, if we don't speak up now, we will lose this. Uh, what we're seeing is the codification into law. The verdict against me on June 15th now has an impact on every Filipino. We're appealing this, but having having this verdict that has changed the statute of limitations for libel from one year to 12 years, because in order to even get this to court, that needed to happen. Mm. Uh, uh, having this verdict that says you can retroactively impose a law, the, the law we supposedly violated with a story we published in 2012 didn't even exist when we publish this story. So there are lots of legal acrobatics that we are challenging, and we must challenge all of that. But this was the first codification that will impact all of Filipinos. The second is our anti-terror law, which was just signed into law. This essentially now is being challenged at the Supreme Court by many different groups because it essentially would allow a small group of cabinet secretaries to name any critic or any dissenter a terrorist. And the minute they do that, they can deploy surveillance, they can arrest them without a warrant, 
and then they can hold them in jail for up to 24 days. Right. So these are some of the things that we're fighting for. So Maria, tell us just briefly, because this is also um, a question that we have from somebody who's based in the Philippines um, that's coming through via Facebook Live. Jide Monk is asking the following. Given all of that, what you're talking about, I mean, it, it seems as if, you know, it's, it's escalating um, the authoritarian nature due to the coronavirus um, environment in your country. DJ Monk wants to know what safety protocols were taught to journalists at Rappler to protect themselves from the high, high, highly likely threat, excuse me, of harassment by the government. So the first is, uh, and this is not as necessary today, but we actually had to increase our security up to six times in the last four years. Uh, the second is that we have prepared for worst case scenarios, you know, uh, and we, we have workflows and drills we know what we're supposed to do. We are, because the first step for everything, kind of like Lena said, is to be mentally prepared. Everything begins in your mind. And actually, uh, that, that you said briefly, the last thing I will really say on this is the manipulation of the mind is part of what we're trying to prevent. Mm. And that is where we need the help of social media platforms. Because right now, they have allowed multiple realities to exist. And these are lies. Without the integrity of facts, journalists cannot exist. Without the integrity of facts, democracy can't exist. Um, Marcus, I'd like to turn to you um, then to ask you the following question that's coming from Ivana Ebel. What needs to be done in regards to information flow in states that are theoretically democratic but dangerously shifting toward the end of the rule of law? For example, what's happening in Brazil? The Philippines. Or the Philippines, yeah. as Maria mentions. So as Maria already said, what we are increasingly seeing is that we see new co codification of laws which criminalize journalists, activists, civil society, and which also put in place telecom very restrictive telecommunications and media uh, regulations um, to, to actually target critics and expanding the powers of, of state security services. So this shows, at the same time, we see that civil society is pushing back. We see, we see courts pushing back. And um, as we've seen many people walking the streets last year, be it in Egypt or Iran, or be it now around Black Lives Matter. But it's a critical time, as Maria said. We have high dynamics. So I think we will need different approaches. We will need, in every country, now is the time that people need to understand we need to talk about these things. And this is not, this is just important that we, we talk about very basic things like rule of law, um, 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 which uh, transparency, accountability, in, in, in remedy, the right to remedy for people, but on an international level, also some basic protocols and safeguards. And this starts with technology. We, we need to install some basic regulations around some global protocols and safeguards, but also around uh, state uh, um, legislative approaches. Um, mm. it, it, needs, it needs all of this at this point. Um, but, but yes, I mean, if you look at the numbers, we see the shifts in many democratic societies. The rule of law is challenged. Even independent courts are being challenged. Um, but we, as I said, we see that many people are getting aware. Of course, the coronavirus is, is increasing the speed of certain things happening. So I think it's just important that, like today, we speak about these things, we connect to each other, and we, we remind the people that if, if we are looking at the future of tomorrow, then this mm. is a and and the internet and digital spaces are our marketplaces and our public spaces. We need to we need to govern them as we as we put up regulations to for our public spaces to be safe spaces. And in the end, we shouldn't forget that it, that luckily there are still these public spaces, and that's why people walk the streets. And we will have to do both. Um, so, yes, I think this is a call to everyone. Um, if you are in a safe place, if you have the privilege of being in a country which has a government which obeys to a rule of law and international law, push them to push other governments to yeah. abide to international law. Push your corporations and your businesses 
not not to work behind human rights and international law, but also not to support uh, these authoritarian governments. So there's plenty everyone can do. We just have to look around. And, and while we are waiting for that action to happen, though, um, you know, individuals like Lena and Maria are taking the situation into their own hands. And I'd just like to ask you, because this question came in for you, Lena. Um, this came from one of our colleagues, actually, at Deutsche Welle, Ingo Manteuffel, who wants to sort of know what your wish list is. Um, he wants to know what kind of digital tools you would like to see as a solution to your most pressing challenge at the moment. Uh, I would like uh, to, yeah, I would like to find uh, ways um, through which we can publish a bit more seamlessly, um, given the given the blocking of our website. But to be honest with you, I, I, I you know, besides uh, circumvention tools, I'd like to, you know, to work with my legal right to operate in this country as a professional media outlet. So as much as I'd love to engage with technology that would help us further seamlessly uh, navigate the blocking of our website and, you know, the, the censorship circumvention tools, see them a bit more developed and so on. Um, um, I would like to be able to get uh, an, a, a legal license to operate because I'm not doing anything wrong uh, and I have the right to, to operate and that's an important uh, battle uh, to fight. Uh, and obviously my other wish list is, is, is for our government to stop um, getting supplies of um, Censorship and surveillance tools through which uh, you know they can uh, they can intercept everything from our professional dealings to our private lives and so on. So, so yeah. Maria, anything else that you would like to add, perhaps? I think that we're at we're poised, and this is a global problem, right? Uh, the role of technology is it going to be used for evil or is it going to be used for good? And I think that. That is something that isn't in our hands. Uh, everything flows downhill, right? And in many ways, those decisions that are being made in Silicon Valley, uh, that's something the world can help us with because we are all on these platforms and the platforms are now manipulating us and this must stop. So as Marcus said, regulation is one way. Germany has certainly done that. But beyond that, the micro-targeting has come to a point that you know you can actually give infinite realities to different people. And that manipulation must stop. That manipulation must stop. Um, well, we are almost concluding here um, at the Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum for our panel. But I'd just like to ask you um, before we go, because we've been discussing how the digital revolution can ultimately succeed in boosting and sustaining diversity of opinion in autocratic countries. Um, Marcus, your final thoughts? Your final words, your call to action, whether it be to, you know, state actors, non-state actors, big tech, what would you like to see in the next years? I think the solution to a modern digital life in which we can, in which we, we really can participate with our human rights and freedom is starts in those countries where this freedom still exists. It starts in those countries where, where civil society and people can speak up, where governments should feel obliged to be part of the, of the her solution. And that is, is the solution for, for, those, for those states and those people where there are already restrictive authoritative governments. And um, this one thing we mentioned was regulation. It's great to see how people now uh, are stopping hate for profit. Uh, this is a good time. This is the right step. Let's take this forward. It can't be that you're participating in a modern digital world, even in a free democratic country, and you are not in control of the profiles, the data, um, and the surveillance which is happening around you. And this, is, this happens even in, where freedom of press and a free internet is there. And we need to kick it off there. We need to we need to make clear that we have expectations and requirements and asks for clear principles. And then we need to roll out and stand with those people in, in, in repressive countries, stand with them and push these principles 
to for them and with them standing next to them. So those who have the privilege have the responsibility. Lena, your final thoughts. Um, I would like to uh, to uh, invite um, readers uh, to keep insisting on the right for free information and to trust their intelligence um, in being able to reach uh, that information. Um, and I would like to remind that this is actually uh, the the thrust that make us continue um, continue to exist in a world where the online spaces have become far more filtered, far more controlled by um, third parties besides the government, such as the the companies that basically um, that basically control through their algorithms what reach people. So what's left really for us is the trust in our ability to produce quality journalism and the trust in people's desire to access free and properly produced uh, information and narratives as I said before. Trust, that's also something you talked about, Maria. Trust, truth, democracy, they're all going hand in hand. Um, some final thoughts to please leave with us with here. The days when journalists were gatekeepers are long gone. And now the new gatekeepers are tech. They're technology companies. And they have abdicated responsibility for protecting the public sphere. That's the reality we live in. And I'm going to echo Marcus in saying that we need regulation. But I also appeal to the social media platforms to have enlightened self-interest, right? Destroying democracy in many parts of the world is not going to help you, and destroying democracy in your own country certainly is not going to help you in the medium and long term. You can make a lot of money right now. So I think that that the the influence operations that continue on the platforms, and you know, what are influence operations? I think that's the poison, the lies said exponentially, said a million times, becomes fact. That's why people are so confused. That's eroded trust. That's eroded the strength of institutions. So once you have that, uh, you actually remember the goal of influence operations, because this is part of what Facebook says that, you know, it's they're after coordinated inauthentic behavior and they will take that down. Well, that was like four years ago. So now that coordinated inauthentic behavior has changed the minds and the behavior of real people. And what will we do now, right? I think that's that's what I'm most worried about because these influence operations continue. We feel it in the Philippines. Uh, you should feel it in the United States. Uh, we need to deal with this right now. A really important call to action. And, um we want to thank you so much for joining us for this session of the Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum 2020 between Utopia and Dystopia, the Internet and Autocratic States. I would like to first and foremost thank our panelists, Maria Reza, Lina Atala, Marcus Biko, for um, your really important insights. We also want to thank our participants for joining us online and for asking all of those excellent questions. The next session is planned for August 12th. We will share the details soon. In the meantime, you can follow us on social media and and keep checking our website, dw.com slash GMF, for more interviews, articles, and videos. The conversation most certainly continues. My name is Sarah Kelly. I've been joining you from Berlin. I hope to see you again soon. In the meantime, we do hope that you take care and stay safe.